this will be an interactive session about uh, the Space Mesh protocol. I'll start with a little bit about myself and then uh, sort of a high level view of the protocol. And if you have questions, then please uh, don't hesitate to ask and we'll sort of get into the details where you're interested and skip over the details where you're not interested. Um, so my background is from academia. I'm an academic cryptographer by training and uh, I'm a professor at IDC Alcilia. My uh, research area is, uh, as I said, cryptography and I'm most interested in sort of the theoretical side of cryptography where it meets sort of real world problems and how we can sort of join the two together. So before working on cryptocurrencies, I worked on things like cryptographic voting. Um, uh, but then at some point, I uh, discovered this uh, sort of new magic trick. And in general, I think uh, crypto is sort of the magic, uh, magic tricks of uh, computer science. You do the impossible with, uh, with math. Um, and there's this new magic trick called uh, Bitcoin that solved the problem that uh, people had proved previously was impossible. That is, how can we get this uh, consensus on a ledger in, uh, in, on the internet in what we call now a permissionless setting where we don't know who the people participating are and anybody can just pretend to have as many identities as they want. So since the 70s we knew that it's impossible to get this kind of thing unless a majority of the participants in the protocol are honest. But if anybody can just pretend to be as many people as they want, there's no way to guarantee that. So the magic trick that uh, Satoshi pulled is sort of to sidestep this and say, let's not look at people, let's look at resources. So instead of sort of counting a majority of people in the protocol, we're going to count a majority of a limited resource. In his case, uh, CPU work. And now suddenly you can do all sorts of things that you couldn't do before. Um, so, so this is what got me interested. And I started looking sort of the theory behind it. There's some really nice things. And there's also uh, lots of interesting open questions. Again, as a theoretician, you know, an open question is a call to try to solve it. So this is what got me started. And basically the, the motivation for designing Space Mesh uh, was mainly three things. So the first is the resource that uh, Satoshi chose was proof of work. And this is very nice from a security standpoint. It has really good properties, but it's horrible from an environmental standpoint because this proof of work requires everyone to use their CPU all the time at maximum capacity. And it doesn't help if we can you know, improve, get something more efficient, the CPUs get better. It won't help us because we'll just need to run faster to stay in the same place. So this is horrible for the environment. So this is one problem that uh, I would like to, to try to solve or this that motivated me. Uh, a second problem is incentive compatibility. Oops. So what is incentive compatible? A protocol is incentive compatible if somebody who's only out for themselves, a rational uh, user, would prefer to run the protocol than to do something else. And why is this important for permissionless uh, cryptocurrency protocols? Because we rely for security on an assumption that there's an honest majority controlling the, the resources. But if in real life the majority is not purely altruistic and honest, but they actually are rational, they would like to make as much money as possible, and the protocol is not incentive compatible, that is, there's something better they could do to get more money for themselves other than run the actual protocol, suddenly our security collapses. And in Bitcoin, it turns out this is the case. Bitcoin is not incentive compatible. And the time I started looking at it, there came out these uh, uh, proofs that an actual attack called selfish mining that show that it's actually sometimes better to withhold blocks, to keep the block to yourself rather than publish it to everyone um, in order to get more money so that you can start building the next block before anybody else sees it. And OK, this is good for maybe a, a miner who does that himself. But if everybody did this, it would be horrible because the system would collapse. Basically, 
there would be you know, a huge number of forks, and nobody could agree anymore on what the correct ledger is. So it's not clear yet why Bitcoin doesn't collapse. There are other uh, factors at play, and not everybody is completely rational. But this is not a good state for a system to be in. So another motivation was we want to try to design a cryptocurrency protocol where you can prove that it's incentive compatible. It's actually better to run the protocol than uh, to run something else, or at least it's not worse to run the protocol. And finally, there's an issue of throughput. So in Bitcoin, right now, the throughput is something like seven transactions per second, maybe even lower. And some of that is uh, due to like, specific implementation issues with Bitcoin. But some of that is actually inherent in the way that Bitcoin works, in this uh, blockchain protocol. And why does that happen? So if we look at how a blockchain protocol works, we have a block, and now all the miners try to create a new block pointing to the old block, and then miners try to create another block pointing to the next block. How do they know which block to point to? They use the longest chain rule. So they take the longest chain they can see and extend that. Um, but what happens if there are two chains that are the same length? Well, in that case, they can choose. Say they flip a coin and decide which one to extend. So if we see a chain like this, this is not a good state because miners or everybody who's using the system can't tell which is the right chain. There's two different histories and we don't know which is the right one. So we don't have consensus on the history and we cannot run a cryptocurrency unless we have consensus on history. So how come Bitcoin doesn't continue this state forever? Right? What prevents miners from one extends this, another extends this at the same time and just keeping on uh, in this balanced state forever. It's because of a, a nice property of how these blocks are generated. They're generated uh, using a random process. And it has this property that for a period of, uh, for, for a long enough period, there's a good probability that only a single block will be generated and nobody else will be able to generate a block at that same time. And this period is long enough that after the block is generated, everybody else can see that block before a new one is generated. And because that's the case, if we ever have this symmetric uh, thing, it can continue until we get to this good period. And then somebody will generate a block. You'll choose one of them. And now everybody will see this block uh, before the next block is generated. So this is going to be the longest chain. The symmetry is broken. And because these periods are frequent enough and long enough, then uh, we always break symmetry pretty quickly. And then we have this sort of uh, honest majority argument where the longest chain always grows faster than the other chain, so we can never catch up once we have this uh, symmetry broken. So this is great, but it has a problem. What is the problem? In order for this to happen, for there to be only one block, we need the blocks to be far enough apart. If the blocks are too close together compared to the network latency, to how long it takes for blocks to propagate through the network, then we won't have these periods. And then this situation will continue, could continue forever. In fact, it could get much worse. It could just split more and more. And we'll have lots of blocks, and everybody will see many different chains of the same length, and we'll never get consensus. So this means if we want to increase the throughput, Right, then we can do basically two things. We can put the blocks closer together so we get more blocks in the same time period. But that has a limit because once we put them too close together compared to latency, we lose. The other thing we can do is we can increase the size. We can have more things in a block, more transactions. But if we increase the size of the block, the latency grows. So it takes longer for the block to propagate. And so we, we're sort of attacking from the other side. Again, we can't do this too much because once the frequency is too close to the latency, we don't have consensus anymore. So this is an inherent problem. We can't, if, if we're using this kind of protocol, we cannot get throughput that's uh, even close to the network throughput. It depends on the network latency, not just on the network throughput. OK, so these are the three uh, motivations. How do we solve them in space mesh? So the first thing we do is we replace this uh, resource, the proof of work, with a different resource, which we call proof of space time. Basically, in a proof of work, you're showing you have CPU. In a proof of space time, you're showing you have storage. 
why is it space time and not space? Because the actual cost is you're showing that you used your storage over a period of time, right? If you think of how I pay for storage, right? I'm, I'm renting storage from Amazon. I pay them for one terabyte for a month, not for one terabyte. So this is the actual resource that you're using. And so now our assumption becomes instead of an honest majority of work, we have an honest majority of space time. Why is space time better than work? Because storage doesn't require energy um, to, to work, right? I, I can fill my disk. I don't need to write or uh, erase the disk. I just need it to be full and to store data. And for that, I can just turn off the computer and the disk will keep storing data. So in terms of energy use, it's a lot better than proofs of work. And in fact, it also sort of aligns the technology in the same direction. So maybe now disks do require a little bit of energy. If somebody makes a better disk that requires less energy, that's only better for us. Because you can use this disk and you'll use less energy. You don't need to keep working as hard as possible uh, just to keep up. OK, the second uh, and third uh, motivations, we basically do something to solve them together. And that is we replace this chain with a mesh. So what is a mesh? It's a layered DAG, a directed acyclic graph. And so now instead of having a block every 10 minutes, we have, say, 200 blocks, which we call a layer, every five minutes. Uh, so again, the five minutes, uh, the 200, these are just parameters that we're uh, using. The protocol can support different parameters. These are all tweakable things. So we have uh, layer one, it has 200. Layer two, all these uh, blocks point to all the blocks in the uh, previous layers. Right? So this is why it's not a chain anymore. OK, so how does this solve these two problems? Um, well, we'll start with uh, throughput. That's sort of easy to see. Instead of one block, we have 200 blocks. So we have 200 times the throughput. Um, and the protocol is not sensitive to latency, or at least not nearly as much. We can increase this to 800 blocks if we want, if the network throughput supports it, and get even more throughput. So now we're limited by the network throughput rather than the network latency. So that's the, the why throughput is solved. How does this help with incentive compatibility? Well, the reason that uh, selfish mining works, that these problems occur in blockchains, is because we have a race to generate the next block. And if I generated a block, but somebody else published their block first, they can win the race, and then I just lose my block. And when you mine selfishly, what you're doing is you're sort of giving yourself a head start in the race. So this is sort of an unfair advantage. What we do here, because we, we have many blocks at the same time, right? In, in a blockchain, we can only have one. So somebody has to lose. Here, we have 200. And in fact, it's not exactly 200. It's just on average 200. We can have you know, more or less than 200. We can guarantee that every block that was generated by an honest user is going to get in. So there's no more race, which means now it's no longer uh, in your best interest to store a block locally. Yeah. I have a question. Is uh, every block in this, in this one layer, mm -hmm. this one transaction, or, or has, uh, No, so every block has many transactions, many. yes. So in fact, they, they have actually pointers of transactions, but yes, every block points to many different transactions. Yes. I didn't understand that your last sentence. You said you can guarantee every block mined by an honest user it, gets into the, into the mesh. Why? You limit it to 2,000. So that's why I said it's not exactly 200. Never mind. Right? So, Never so, mind. What's the number? What's the difference between 1 or 200? OK, so the difference is very big if it's 1 or more than 1. Right? If there's 1, then you cannot have 2. So, so, so the point is there's no race about um, entering a block into a layer, you know in advance when it's your turn to produce it. Okay? So you're not trying... So you're saying something different. No, you're not trying... Not all honest miners will try to enter a block in layer one. Okay. Yes. So you can... Okay, so, so there is some sampling mechanism where out of all of the miners, around 200 will be eligible. It's not about one or 200. It's about the... the being able to predict when it's going to... No, no, it's, it's about one versus more than one. Right? If you can only have one, then know, if there are two, you have to choose one of them. So, okay, so this is, this is the difference. If you only have one, if you're not allowed to have more than one because you need a chain, 
then if you have two, you have to decide one of them is valid and one of them is not. If you're allowed more than one, technically we can say as many as you want. Okay? It will turn out to be about 200, but the, the protocol allows as many as you want. Then if it turns out that you know, 300 blocks are generated, but that's isn't also there fine. Is a race factor no matter what the number? No, because all of them get in. Right? We, it doesn't, if I put my block there and you put your block there, we no longer have to say one of them loses. They're both, they're, you know, you win, I win, we all win. But the number is limited. Let, let, no. Let me clarify. Okay. What Tal says actually has two steps. So the first step is, let's assume, anyone can produce a block in each layer. Okay? So if we have uh, 50 miners, we have 50 blocks, we have 500 miners, we have 500 blocks, and so on. Okay? So this, is the, this is the first step, and this is why each honest block will be uh, in, in the mesh. Okay, you want to continue from there? Yes, okay, so, so now the question is, I guess yeah, what Brack is saying is, is uh, I think, a good point, right? So there's the initial thing is we don't limit the number of blocks oh, in, okay. in a layer. No there's no limit. What there is, it, we, we do sort of have an average which makes sure that it just doesn't explode in terms of communication complexity, but we don't do that by saying you cannot put another block in. We do that by making sure that not too many honest users get sort of self-selected, right? So think of it, this, the same thing can work. So think of, of a proof of work system, okay? In a proof of work system, right, there is some probability that you'll generate the correct uh, work, right? But not, you have, you know, a million miners, that you set the difficulty of the work so that about 200 of them will generate it. Now, if it was the chain, then out of those 200, you have to select one. Here we're saying out of those 200, you select all of them. If you happen to solve the proof of work, you're in. So we don't use proof of work, we use proof of space time. So instead of doing what I said right now, we do something a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, but please continue, but when you will finish, I, I okay. guess the next one. So, so what we do is basically you're going to prove, we, we divide these layers into epochs of two weeks. And in every epoch, you're going to prove that you stored, you, know, you filled your disk with some data. You stored it for two weeks. And then, once you did that, you're guaranteed uh, a place in the next epoch, but you're guaranteed a random place. So you're going to select randomly one of the places, and because there are many, many layers, uh, then it turns out that the way we, we build the number of blocks that everybody gets to generate, you have about 200 uh, blocks at each layer. It could be that some have more and some have less, because you know, it's a random process. But this is what it works out to, more or less. And, and of course, we can tweak this parameter if we want to make it more higher or lower, depending on uh, what we want to do. Yes? So my question is, uh, how do you manage the double spending problem? Because okay, you have great. Layer. I was just g going to get to that. Ah, so, okay. so one thing that uh, you might think in a chain is easy is to get uh, maybe two things. One is to get a, a full ordering on transactions. Right? Because in a chain, it's very clear what the order is. There's the first block, the second block, the third block, and you have the first transaction, the first block, and you go through the first block. Se first transaction, the second block, and so on. Here, we have 200 blocks that are simultaneously uh, transmitted. So what's the full order? So the first claim is, if we manage to agree, to have consensus about this mesh, then solving this full ordering problem is easy. Why? So suppose that everybody agrees what's in the mesh. What we're going to do is just say, sort these blocks by alphabetical order. We agree on the contents. By what? Alphabetical order. Alphabetical. This is just an example. Order. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, some yeah, deterministic yeah. order. But everybody has the same input to this uh, sorting, right? So they'll get the same output. So they'll all agree on the ordering of the blocks. So now we do have a chain, right? We, we go like this. And then we can take, again, the same thing. First transaction here, second, third, and so forth. The second problem we have is that when I put transactions in a blockchain, I know exactly what came before me, right? So I can make sure there are no double spends. I can make sure that there are no conflicting, that, uh, that there are no duplicate transactions, right? I, I can do all of those things before I put them in the block. Here, when I'm generating this block, I don't know whether I'm going to be before or after another block. I don't know what the other blocks are. So what do we do? And again, this problem is pretty simple to solve. What we do is we say, once we know what the, or this, the order of the transactions, then we can say, OK, if you have several transactions, it doesn't make a block invalid to have a duplicate. So I have A here and A here. I'll only take the first one. 
if I have a double spend, so suppose I have A and not A, right? These are conflicting transactions. Then again, I can say the first one counts, the second one doesn't, right? So uh, as long as it's a deterministic thing, I can make sure that you know there's a consistent state and everybody's in the same state. But, uh, I, I have a question because um, with, the, with the double spend, if I understand this well, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you will have one one uh, one uh, wallet where you have, for example. Uh, one token, yeah? yes, and then you are uh, in the same layer putting mm -hmm. the, the the first uh, uh, first uh, miner is putting yes. uh, zero point seven of the token. Yeah, go to to, uh, to to one place, and the another miner is putting again zero point seven. So put the second yes. to the other. So you can Those even are put the whole the, token, right? But, but, but no, all, more than one token. More than okay. one. Token. So so you, you have double spending, but yeah. each of those transactions is within the limit. If you would uh, right now, right. So, uh, so that this is this case, right? Uh, so here I, I yes, spend. Yes, but, but how am I talking that? Because yeah, you who gets in? The, the, yes. But by the uh, uh, transaction, those could uh, look like completely different transactions. You, you are solving so, this. Okay. So, so obviously, what will finally happen depends on the order. Yeah. But the point is that once we, we agree on the order, we'll have a consistent state. So suppose this A is Alice sends Bob the token, and this not A is Alice sends Charlie the token. Okay, obviously they cannot both be valid because she only has one token. But if we, this is the order that we decided on, okay. then so Alice will send it to Bob, and when we get to here, we'll say, she already sent it to Bob, this doesn't matter. Yeah, and of course, if you're Bob, you cannot accept the token and give her whatever she's buying until you see the whole layer and you're convinced that this is going into history. But this is the same thing with Bitcoin, right? If you see something in a block, you have to wait a little bit until you're sure that there won't be conflicting yeah, that blocks. That is here as well. You need several confirmation. Yes, yes. here it, it actually can happen faster uh, because we'll see, we, we have this extra protocol that makes things go faster, but yes, we have the same thing. So try and envision this in my head as opposed to like, you know, how you, you, know, you like envision blockchain, like block, mm -hmm. chain, block, you know, chain, etc. Mm -hmm. Like a, let's say like a linear piece of string, yeah. so to say. Would this essentially be like your layers act like topless as blocks in some way, where it's like a mesh net, a square mesh net that gets laid down on top of another square mesh net, which gets laid down on top of another mesh net. You can think of it net. that way. Yeah. And then if you were to like use a block explorer to find out the transaction, it would be like layer five, row four, yeah. Five. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. How do you approve state? So, uh, how is the state stored? How is it stored? The state. On yes. disk. How does it sit on the same pool of data that you use for the space time? No. Okay. So, so, what is this space time that you're proving that you have? One important property of this is that you should not be able to amortize it. Right. You shouldn't be able to use your same disk. Like once to do many different, to pretend you have many different disks. So if you just used the, uh, the block mesh itself, this is bad because it's the same data. I can't tell if you're storing it once or 500 times. So what we do here is your storage is linked to your identity. <coughs> Basically, your identity is what gets paid, and you're only allowed sort of one block or one, one proof per identity. Um, and what you store is a table of proofs of work. And what's an identity? I'm sorry? An identity, what's an identity is a public key. Yeah. So you store a table of proofs of work. Uh, why, why is it this what you store? Because we want you to be able to generate this data on your own. You don't want to have this huge amount of communication where you have to get data from somebody else. Yeah. But if, is there any state size management? How do you prevent the state to grow to size that you kind of manage it? Okay, so I mean, this is the, the same question to do with any uh, chain. We have to keep everything. Right? Oh yeah, but how do you do that? I mean, do you do pruning? Do you? Do you so at the moment we don't do any. Like you don't charge rent. It may happen that I blow the blockchain putting worthless data to the point that it's difficult to sync among the other the mesh. I mean, we we have you know, incentive uh, structures to make it, but, but this is like a second uh, level, right? So how? What, what I'm talking about now is the consensus protocol. It, it actually doesn't care about these questions. And at a second level, you're right. We do have to, to take care of this, like how you prevent people from just 
you know, flooding the network with things that everybody has to store forever. But it, it hasn't been researched yet, eventually. No, no, we, we do have some uh, things in this direction, but th this is, uh, like, it, it hasn't been fully specified yet. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. Is, is there any influence or protocol based on the storage lifetime? I mean, if I have my storage, my hard drive, that suddenly one day it's just simply dead. Right. right. So you can so always more. regenerate. So, so this is what I'm trying to, you know, like how, how this is built, right? Yeah. So this is built as a table of proofs of work where what you need to remember to create this table is just your identity. Okay, well, if you have your identity, you can always do the work and fill up the table again. What you're actually proving is not that you stored the data, it's that you either stored the data or did the work and recreated the data. But because it's a proof of work, we can make the, this uh, recreation process expensive enough that it's rational to store the data instead. When you say recreation, you mean cloning? No, no. I, I'm saying you, can, you have a disk, OK? So this, say, is one terabyte of data. Yeah. You can store one terabyte of data for two weeks. Yeah. And then after two weeks, you do very little work. And you prove you basically have to just read it. And you prove that you're, you're still storing it. Okay. okay. And then two weeks later, you prove it again. But you don't do work. Yeah. Or you can say, look, my hard drive is dead. but now, okay, but let's consider before the hard drive is dead, let's consider okay. the case where I want to use my hard drive for something else. Okay, okay I erase it. <laughs> I completely erase it. Okay. So now two weeks have passed. I can still do this proof. I, what I have to do first is just do the proof of work again. I can refill the, the drive with the proof of work. What is the meaning of it? Like timeline or? So it's expensive. It's a proof of work. So I have to use now my CPU uh, and electricity and do work to fill this data again. And how the data is sit on the hard drive? Files? It's a file. It's a you mean several file. files, but yes. So for example, if someone actually wants to hire people using your protocol to run some work. So basically then it's very hard because if you know your your private key you can always regenerate it, it costs you a little bit to regenerate. So how much does it actually cost to generate this proof of work? The critical point is it needs to cost more then it costs to store the data for two weeks. Yeah. But it doesn't need to cost a lot more than that. Right? So, so it's not a very high cost, yeah, just a because storing is actually quite cheap. So what we're targeting now is something like two days of GPU work. Okay. Um, yeah. In terms of fairness, yes. let's say, how is this algorithm is more fair than the Bitcoin algorithm? OK, so, so in terms of because uh, there's a there's a specific, for if proof of work is mainly based on electricity. Yes. So, OK, so, yeah. so let, let me add. Here is the advantage of storage. Here. <coughs> so this why? is, why do we think this is more egalitarian, yeah. more fair? Um, so in proof of work, you have specialized devices, ASICs, that can do the proof of work much, much more cheaply. Yeah, I'm talking about the storage compared to yeah, CPU. But, the, but to this CPU. is exactly the, the, the point, storage compared to, to proof no, of no, work. No, no, because uh, you can have cheaper storage, basically. So you can do the so, same so optimization. The I'm saying, in, in terms of, let's not talk about CPU, let's talk about electricity, OK? okay. Because eventually everyone can buy an, an A6. Uh, CPU and can can have the same level of uh, computation as any other. Okay. Right. Yeah. The cost is the electricity. What but differ but one miner for the other uh, in terms of profit is the electricity cost. In the, in the proof of work system. Yes, yeah. in the proof of work system. No. So so the, the point is that it's not true that everybody can buy the ASIC. Put that but, but this is a critical say, point. You no, no, it's it not a critical point. But it's another discussion. I'm, I'm trying to shift this discussion to a very specific, to okay. another discussion. Okay. I get what you're saying about the ASIC. That's yeah. not. Okay. So, my, so what is what that's is not question? my question? My question is, electricity, mm -hmm. the, 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 the the different in cost in terms of electricity yes. versus the different in cost in terms of storage. That's my okay. Point. So so why is it? Uh, why is it more fair to? Yes. To okay. use storage. So storage doesn't scale linearly. There's a limit on the storage you can grow the more money you have. Yeah. No, but the, the, storage I mean, costs differently in many, in yes, other, I, in many okay. places in so, the world. So there are economies of scale for storage, right? So Amazon pays less for a, for a disk than I do. Exactly. Um, but what we're targeting is, and this has a lot to do with ASICs, 
is people who have home computers, and they already have a sunk cost in storage. So they have a disk that's quite big, and they don't use most of it. And their marginal cost for this extra disk is zero. So even though for Amazon it costs uh, very little compared to me to buy a whole disk, I'm not going to buy a whole disk for this. Right? It's not worth it for me maybe to buy a disk. But if I already have the disk, it is worth it for me to use the disk I have. And ideally what we'd have is, yes, we'd have a few large players, but we'd have a long tail of small players who have zero marginal cost for their storage. I'm targeting people who've got a bunch of leftover like uh, Western digital hard drives at home. And here the ASIC thing yeah. is very important because yeah, if I fair. need to buy an ASIC in order to use this, then suddenly my marginal cost is not low. Um, so just I might have missed this, but like, what's yes. considered an identity, or it's a public what's thing. to stop? No, I'm just think in the sense of what's to stop me from buying 15, 10 terabyte hard drives in my house? Nothing. Um, That's a good thing. And and my, like let's say mining this and just reaping more of the benefits as opposed to. So, I, like I know, I know that you, like yeah, you said there'd be more bigger players and the people okay, at home so, can just so, do this. But is there anything we, stopping me from having a hundred terabytes at home and nothing will mining stop more? Like, is your incentive? Yeah. That's, 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 that's a good thing. I want you to buy it. Yeah. yeah, it's fine. But did you do like a study or some? I, I, again, going to my point about the electricity versus storage. Did you do like you have like of, of what? Or, what are you yeah. asking? I think yeah. the big players would have a much, much more advantage over smaller players. In regards to storage, you're asking if storage you know, is better like, than electricity. Yeah. Yeah. Access to storage is something that is. Uh, so so the big store, players will have some advantage. Right. Yeah. It's, no, but it's, 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 it's one thing yeah. versus the other. It's not. It's not. So the question is. Is it really zero marginal cost? If it is, then you don't have an advantage, right? Because they cannot have, no matter how low your disk is, it's not going to be zero for Amazon. Right? So if you have yeah. enough people who have zero marginal cost, yeah. then it's good. Just if not, so, in comparison to electricity, that's all. That's so, but in, in electricity, you don't have the zero marginal cost, thing, right? There, there's just no way you can do a proof of work without paying, and you actually pay a lot more because you have you know, three orders of magnitude difference between somebody who has an ASIC. No. You don't you have three orders. Storage. You can buy, but again, you're not. If, if it's a zero magnitude, a zero marginal no. cost, you you're already have the storage, so you're not buying it. But even if you are buying it, I don't think there's a three orders of magnitude difference. So you're not paying a thousand times less for a disk the, and compared to if you have an ASIC versus you have a computer without an ASIC. That is the, the difference in terms of the cost. Yeah. So I guess there are two questions. One is. It's hard to You're say exactly what will happen. You're coming back to the ASIC argument, and I'm trying to. But but it's very relevant. But anyway, what, what's the, what's the what will actually happen is something we'll have to see empirically. Um, our system will still be secure if it has several large players versus a lot of small players. Of course, we'd want it to have a lot of small players, but you know, it's not going to cause the crash if it has 15 giant players rather than uh, you know, 100,000 small ones. Yes. Um, I, don't, I mean, obviously, you get you. I mean. The cost to be a miner, let's say, or like mm -hmm. it, it all would, deter would be sorry, would be determined by the price of the token, I guess, in order to mine. But that's the reward. Yeah, yeah the reward. But um, well, is there anything like if I would go rent, you know, ten thousand terabytes of hard drive space on Amazon and had identities, like you know, multiple identities mining all at the same time? So it's a, okay, it's a question of if if the token is worth enough, then it might be worthwhile for a while. Um, but you know, th this is something that you cannot prevent, right? If, if there's huge speculation, the token is suddenly worth a billion dollars per token, yes. But then Amazon or, would be doing it themselves. So. Or limits per. So the, the, the price of storage would suddenly go up. Limits per IP, or I don't know. No, I mean, we, we don't want to have any artificial things that depend on trusting your IP, your ISP, or things like that. So we can't actually prevent this, um, and you know. It, I, I don't think it's really critical to prevent it. It's something that will self-correct after a while. But yeah. It's, uh... Uh, I have a question. Uh, how will the information is uh, propagated over the over the network of the miners? Because you have one layer, yeah. Yeah. And so there's a gossip know? network. Just uh, like what it is? there's a gossip network like in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then the rest. We have an underlying gossip. Okay, but uh, right now you have the, the layer and mm -hmm. the, uh, say, uh, 200 uh, right. uh, blocks. Yeah, 
blocks and uh, right now I understand each of the block is generated by different miner. Yeah. Oh, okay, and the, so they are uh, collecting this in, in one line. Mm -hmm. uh, is the, who is deciding uh, which of the uh, transactions to remove due to the double spending? There is okay. a, another separate... Uh, pr yeah. So, uh, so what I didn't here, get to yet is what I said up till now was if we have consensus about what's in this mesh. The tricky part is how we get consensus about what's in the mesh. Yeah. Right, th this is the part that I haven't talked about, so it's not uh, surprising that you don't understand but, uh, why. But before, works. just one question. Yeah. Is there a time limit to, uh, to add the, the blocks uh, to the... Okay, the, so to, to yes, the there is, but it's not direct. So okay. what do I mean? Um, obviously, if we want our uh, ledger to be uh, suitable for cryptocurrency, it cannot be reversible. I can't be able to add blocks in the past. Right? So it cannot be that if somebody generated a block here in this time, but claimed it was here, that suddenly this will become a valid part of this layer. So there has to be some time. But one of the design criteria of Space Mesh was we don't use the local view of, of the timing information to decide validity. Um, why? Because this timing information is something that we don't agree on. Honest parties don't agree on exactly when they receive things because it takes 30 seconds for things to propagate through the network and things from different sides might come at different speeds so we don't even agree on the exact order of things in which we receive. So if we ever try to put thresholds, suppose we say, okay, fine, let's say it takes 30 seconds, we'll take 30 seconds here, and if anything I receive after 30 seconds becomes invalid. Okay, even though it, it looks valid, it's self-consistent, but it arrived late, we'll call it invalid then for honest blocks, that's fine. Honest blocks will always be sent here, and they'll never arrive late, so we'll agree they're all valid. But malicious blocks, the adversary can decide to send them late. And no matter where we put the threshold, it can always just send them exactly on the threshold. And now some honest parties will think the block is early, and some will think it's late. So we'll have disagreement. So in some sense, we have to solve this disagreement somehow, and we cannot use the timing information to do it. Um, so what do we actually do? We use uh, uh, a separate BFT protocol, a binary fault tolerant Byzantine agreement protocol. Okay, so this, this uh, sort of low-level protocol we call the tortoise. It didn't explain how it works, but basically this will guarantee irreversibility, and it can also it has some other nice properties which I won't get into. But on top of that, after every layer is published, we now run in a second protocol, which we call the hair protocol, which is basically a Byzantine agreement protocol, where all the, the nodes decide which of these uh, blocks should be in the layer. And it runs ideally before this uh, ends, before the next layer, so it ends before the next layer starts. So now by the next layer, everybody knows what's the, the blocks that should be in and what blocks should be out. And now, in, in this tortoise protocol, what we do is we vote. So every block votes for the blocks it thinks that are valid, it should be. And for older blocks, we just count votes. Right? So if I see a majority that th thinks a block is valid, then I will vote for it. If I see a majority thinks it's invalid, I will vote against it. And because the honest blocks are always in the majority, then this majority, the, the margin, the, the difference between the number of for votes and against votes is always going to grow in the same direction. So this gets us our irreversibility. Basically, we have this, uh, just like Bitcoin, this not a chain, but a margin that grows and grows, and the probability that it can be reversed goes exponentially down with the size of the margin. Um, so, so this is, the, the, at a very high level, how it works. Yes. Uh, Tony and I would stay here for a couple more minutes if we want to.